What does having faith really mean? Does that mean if I just have faith and believe something that God has to do what I ask him to do? Join us today to find the answer to that question. Good morning. Welcome to our Women's Bible Study. Glad you are joining us today. Uh, First, if you want handouts, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. We have a handout section at the top. Click on that. We are in Galatians Lesson 6. Uh, We are working our way through the book of Galatians, which is something new for us. We usually pick out these really long books to do, but uh, we decided to do something different for our summer series. So this is where we are going. So today I want to start with uh, kind of a story about a man by the name of Charles Blondin. Uh, in 19 or 1859, uh, Charles Blondin was a, a really famous tightrope walker, and he traveled to Niagara Falls. He stretched a three-inch wire over the canyon and walked 1,100 feet from one side to the other. He did this a lot of different times. Uh, one time he did it blindfolded. Uh, one time he uh, cooked an omelet in the middle and ate it. Uh, One time he pushed a wheelbarrow across. He actually did it one time on stilts. But not only did he do that just by himself, but one time he took his manager over with him. His manager got on his back and he walked his manager across the Niagara Falls. Now, I would assume that that would take a whole lot of trust, a whole lot of faith to, to, to cling to somebody tightly enough to be able to take them across overlooking like your death if you if you fall but I'm going to assume that his manager had to learn the word trust or faith really really well before he he actually made that walk but imagine halfway across the middle of the Niagara Falls on this three inch tightrope imagine if the manager said you know Blondin you know what, thanks for taking me this far. But I, I, I'm not going to trust you anymore, so I'm going to try to make it across the rest of the way by myself. I'm just going to take it from here. Which, of course, we know what would happen the minute he got off of Blondin's back. He would have fallen to his death. But that's exactly what we're talking about in the book of Galatians. Paul was trying to explain to them the gospel, which is Jesus alone, putting your faith and trust in Jesus alone. And, and it's like the manager who hung on to Blondin. Blondin, I'm just hanging on to you alone to get me to the other side. But that's what was going on in these churches in Galatia. They decided to stop halfway through and to start earning their way bes- instead of just trusting Jesus. And this is what Paul's argument was with them. Because what we need to do is learn how to cling to Jesus. This is it. Here's Jesus, and I'm clinging to him. I'm not letting go. I'm going to cling to him until the day that I actually make it to heaven. Because I'm only getting there because of him. So I am going to cling to him alone. But the minute I step away and say, "Uh, thanks for getting me this far, but I'm going to start doing things. I'm going to join that church. I'm going to be a good person. I'm going to do all these kind of things. Then I've just just walked away from the true gospel. And this was Paul's message over and over and over to these people. Now, Paul was really frustrated because the Galatian churches that he had brought the message, the true gospel to, they knew the truth. And the truth was they needed to cling to Jesus alone. They knew that. But somewhere along the line, they started listening to this false group of people that came in. They were called the Judaizers. They were infiltrating the church with false doctrine, a false gospel. They were saying things like, Paul's wrong. Don't listen to him. It's not Jesus alone. You don't have to just cling to Jesus. You can kind of like walk across that tight rope yourself. So when the message gets back that this is what's going on in these churches, Paul writes a letter We'll pick it up in Galatians 3, and he starts off with verse 1. And he says, you foolish Galatians. That's a big statement. Like, what is wrong with you people? 
You knew the true gospel. You knew what this is all about. What is wrong with you? He goes on to say, who has bewitched you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? Who, who's giving you a message that isn't true? Verse 2 says this. This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? In other words, when you heard by faith, did you come over and cling to Jesus and hold on to him? Or was something else going on? Or did you get a list of rules and regulations that you had to do in order to be saved? What, what, tell me, Galatian church, which one was that? And, and I think we need to ask ourselves that question too. Because how did you and I become a Christian? How did that even happen? And it actually happened because of the Holy Spirit. It's, it's something called a new birth. See, you and I were born physically once, and we need to be born again spiritually. We're born physically into the world, you know, when our mother is born to us, but now we have to be born spiritually. Jesus tells us this in John 3, 5. He said, truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is, flesh is, that which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I say to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. See, people are born again, and it's because the Holy Spirit is doing something in their life. It's like those people that you never thought would ever give their life to Jesus. It's like the hardened criminal. And you're like, what? You know, the, the son of Sam, the David Berkowitz, the, you know, in prison forever. It's like the rich guy who has all the material wealth in the world and the yacht and the boat and all, all these things. And, and yet he realizes that he's missing something, so he gives his life to Christ. It's the child who gives their life to Jesus at 12 years old and serves God until the day they die. It's the Kirk Camerons, the Tim Tebows, it's the you, it's the me. The same thing happened to all of us. It's the Spirit of God that's working in our life that was drawing us to, to Jesus. Look at John 6, 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him and will raise him up on the last day. Titus 3 says this, verse 4, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us. Our salvation is because of something he did, not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration and renewing by who? The Holy Spirit. Someone wrote this. I, I wrote it down and then I forgot who wrote it. So I would give this person credit, but I, I, I literally don't remember where I got this from. But it, it sounded really awesome and it brings to light what we're talking about. He said, bringing the quickening and sustaining breath of God to the cold, dead heart of the believer is the dominant ministry of the Holy Spirit. This was Paul, what he was saying. He's like, you guys didn't come to Jesus because you're doing things. It's because of what the Holy Spirit was doing in your life. Beginning with Jesus' teaching in John 14 to 16 and throughout the remainder of the New Testament, the revelation, ministry, and role of the Holy Spirit takes center stage. The rapid expansion of Christianity that has swept across the world since, since is directly connected to this global wind. Remember, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit was like the wind. The Holy Spirit blows where he wills, and in his wake, pockets of believers are birthed into the kingdom of God. And see, Paul knew that from personal experience. How would Paul ever, ever become a follower of Jesus had the Holy Spirit not done something in his life? It wouldn't have happened. He was too far gone as, you know, that we would have thought. This person goes on to say the Holy Spirit, using the biblical message of the cross, awakens in man that deeply hidden awareness of guilt. He convinces man of sin, even where previously no consciousness of sin was apparently present. The Holy Spirit uses the word of the preacher and touches the heart of the hearer, making it accessible to the word. When the Holy Spirit convinces people of their sin, of Jesus' righteousness and of certain judgment, he awakens the human heart to hear and see the truth in a new way. Upon seeing and perceiving the human heart cries out for God. See, most of you know that. You remember the day that you got saved, and that's exactly what happened to you. Verse 2, he says, This is the only thing I want to find out from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? 
In other words, he's, he's reiterating to these Galatian people, he's saying, how did you come to Jesus? You got to get that figured out first. Because it wasn't the law. It was the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the object of their faith was Jesus alone. Now, I'm going to take a rabbit trail for a lot of this lesson. Because I want to stop and I want to talk about this word faith. Because to become a follower of Jesus, it actually takes faith. But we say, faith in, faith in what? Cheyenne, uh, we went up to Sedona to meet with a florist because for her, her wedding that's coming up. And the florist saw one of Cheyenne's tattoos, and it was, it was about Jesus on her arm, and something to do with faith. I don't remember what it was. The florist looks at Cheyenne, and she says this, Oh my gosh, I have a tattoo, she showed us, right here on my arm that says faith. And, and this woman's not a Christian. And she said, we all need to have faith. It doesn't matter what we have faith in, but we all need to be positive and believe good things will happen. And I walked away and thought, how weird is that to have faith in nothing? I'm just, because faith to them is just, I'm just going to believe. I'm going to believe. I'm going to have faith. I'm just going to believe in what? See, here's what we need to know. There has to be an object to our faith or it's kind of meaningless. See, I think there's a serious problem in a lot of churches today. And I think it's because of this word, faith. And it's done so much harm to people and people are walking away from Jesus because they've misunderstood this word, faith. We hear this. If you just have faith, God will heal you. If you just have faith, God's going to get you that job. If you have faith, then this random check is just going to show up in your mailbox. But when you hear that, it sounds like it's really up to you. It's up to you to produce all this faith, because if you don't produce enough faith, then God's not going to do it. And if you don't get the check in your mailbox, and you don't get that job, or you don't get, then, then you know, it's your fault. And what, what's being taught out there is the focal point of your faith is you. You. You have to do something. But that's not biblical faith at all. Because in biblical faith is this, your focal point is God. Your faith is attached to something. Here's how this looks like. It's like, here's you, and here's God over here. When I have faith, I'm just not having faith in whatever. I am taking my faith, and I am attaching it over here to God. My faith is attached to something. And I'm attaching my faith to, to God and what he has told me in his word. His promises that he's told me. That's what I'm placing my faith in. It's like when, I've told you this story before, when three of our boys were younger, they thought it would be really fun to push the youngest off the roof, like in a crate and, with a sheet, because they were convinced that he could fly. They had faith to believe that this sheet would, would make him fly. Now, I always tell you when I tell the story, like, where was the mother? And the mother was me. And the answer is, I have no idea where I was at that particular time because I don't even know how they got on the roof. I mean, they, they tell me all these things later in life. And I'm like, ah, by the grace of God, my children lived. But see, they, they had faith. Th thankfully, God stopped them. But they had faith in a sheet. But a sheet can't make someone fly. It's a sheet. Now, here's the weird part about that, is that our boys could have quoted scripture and said, I just believe, and God has to do, has to make sure that our brother flies. And I'll, I'll show you what I mean by that. When you read the Bible and you pick out a verse and attach something to that verse without even reading the rest of the Bible, without reading it in context. That's when people get all messed up about faith. Because our boys could have quoted some Bible verses out of context. Look at this. Hebrews 11.1. 1. If that's the only verse you know, and someone quotes it to you, now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. Now our boys could have been like, hey, I'm hoping for the fact that I could fly. I, I, I hope for that. And you know what? I, I'm certain. I don't, I don't see it, but I'm certain of it, so therefore it should happen. 
Do you see what happens there? You take a, a Bible verse and you make it out of context and you make it say something it doesn't say. How about this one? Uh, Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. Hey, the kids could have gone, hey, I'm, I'm believing and praying and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to believe that my brother's going to fly. I mean, it says it right there in the Bible. Look at Mark 9, 23. Jesus said, if you, if, you, if you can believe, all things are possible for those who believe. Now, if I took that out of context and just say, look, flying is possible. I mean, flying is not impossible. I, I can fly. I'm going to believe and push my little brother off the roof and see what happens. But see what happens, how dangerous it can be when you take a Bible verse on faith or belief completely out of context. Because your faith is not attached to something that God has said in context. You have to have scripture interpreting scripture. You just can't take a verse and make it say whatever you want it to say. See, the Bible makes it clear there has to be an object to our faith. I have to trust in God. Not in something or my faith or what my belief. I can't trust it. I have to put my faith someplace. We see this in Matthew 8. Jesus. When Jesus entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed and in terrible suffering. And Jesus said, I will go heal him. Now that is a promise from Jesus. That that Jesus would heal his servant. Verse 8 says, the centurion replied, Lord, I I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. And I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was astonished. And he said to those following him, I tell you the truth, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. See, not much astonishes Jesus, but he's astonished when we actually place our faith in the right thing. You see, the centurion's faith was not in the fact that I'm just going to believe. I'm just going to have faith that, that Jesus is going to heal. No, he literally took and says, you know what? I'm placing my faith in you, Jesus. I'm connecting what you said. You said you were going to heal my son, and I'm placing my faith in you. Nothing else. Not that I just think, think, it, think it up in my head. I'm placing my faith in you. Verse 13. Then Jesus said to the centurion, Go, it will be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was uh, healed at that very hour. Here's what we need to know about faith. Our faith has to be anchored to what God has said or promised. It's like if I went on a train trip from Phoenix to New York. I can hope and believe all I want that the train's going to make it. I just believe, I hope, I just know, I believe. I believe the train's going to make it. But the train may not make it. Because I'm not placing my faith and trust in the right thing. My faith has to be anchored to the one who controls the train. I can't, I don't have faith in an outcome. I have faith in the one who controls the outcome. See the difference, how that works out? See, the problem nowadays is that, that we think faith means I just believe and what I believe for will happen. If I just believe hard enough that that check will show up in the mail, that it will. If I believe hard enough that my kids can fly off the roof and not die, then they will. But here's the problem of what's going on out there. Is because we're being taught that faith is, is something different than biblical faith. When the check doesn't show up, or when my kids push our son off the roof and he dies, or if you don't get that job, our faith is shattered. And then we walk away from Jesus. And it's all because we've placed our faith in the wrong thing. Now, take that into your life and my life. It's easy if we have faith to believe that something is going to happen and then it doesn't. We get frustrated with God and we blame him. But we need to rethink this. Here's what we need to go. Our faith has to be attached to God and his will. Our faith has to be attached to God and his will, what he wants for our life. It's just like 
this whole idea of when COVID hit and our friend Lee got COVID in the hospital. We prayed and prayed and prayed. Nobody had more faith than all the people that were praying for him. God, we have faith you're gonna heal him. We have faith you're gonna heal him. We have faith. But you know what happened? He died. I'm like, well, well what the heck? I had faith that God should, God should have healed him because I had the faith to believe that. But the reason why I wasn't shattered was because nowhere in the Bible does God ever promise that he was going to heal our friend Lee. Because whenever we, have, we pray for someone, we pray as if what Jesus told us to pray and end it with, your kingdom come, your will be done. See, my faith is always in God. My faith is in God who sees things that I don't see and does things I don't even understand most of the time. But here's what I've learned. I've, I put my faith and trust in God because I trust him. I trust him to do what needs to be done, not to do what I expect him to do for me because I prayed with faith. It doesn't work that way. We prayed for Cheyenne to get this one specific job. No one had more faith than Rob and I. We were absolutely convinced this was a job for her, but she didn't get it. But you know why our faith wasn't shattered? Because we had faith in God. We know that God never promised her a specific job. We prayed. We said, God, we, we have faith to believe this is a job, but you know what? We're trusting you with this. I want your will to be done. Even if it's different than what I expect, my trust is in you. Do you see the difference on that? But see, this is so hard for people to understand. Because we hear all these false ideas about faith. Faith isn't this like get out of jail free card. Faith is all about surrender. When you and I decide to give our life to Jesus, that's what that means. It means you lead, I follow. I surrender my will to your will. My faith is not in what you can do for me. My faith is in you. Because you're leading. I trust you. Do you see how that works? It's not a specific outcome, but we're not hearing that much today. We are hearing if you come to Jesus and you pray, then God is obligated to do what you have prayed for because you have faith. Nothing could be farther from the truth. Following Jesus is about getting on board with what he's doing in this world. Following Jesus is about counting the cost, but that doesn't preach very well. Trust me, it preaches much better to say, oh, just have faith and believe and pray and, and God's going to do just what you want. It's a really difficult message to say, you know what? You pray and you have faith and God may not do what you want. Not because he doesn't love you, but because you've surrendered your life to him. He knows what's best. We see this with Jesus in Luke 14, verse 25. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus. Turning to them, he said this, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus doesn't want you to hate anyone, but the point is he's saying, how you love me should feel like you hate everybody else. See, that's what it costs to follow Jesus. I'm surrendering my life to you. It's not about me any longer. Verse 27, Jesus goes on to say, and anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me can't be my disciple. See, following Jesus is not about, I'm placing my faith for you to do what I want you to do. It's placing your faith that says, God, I'm, I, I'd really like this and I'm gonna pray for it, but God, I trust you know what you're doing. And then you're okay with it. He goes on in verse 28, Jesus says, suppose one of you wants to build a tower Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule him, saying the fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he's able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he's not able, he will send a delegation while the, offer is still, uh, the other is still a long way off and ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything, he cannot be my disciple. It's this whole idea of count the cost before you go to war. You've got to count the cost. Before you build a house, you have to figure out the cost. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm going to share with you a great example of this. The other night, um, this YouTube video popped up, and it was Elizabeth Elliot's testimony. Now, for those of you that remember Elizabeth Elliot, she was the wife of Jim Elliot, 
who was a missionary to the Aka Indians in Ecuador. Now, all of his life, all Jim Elliott ever wanted to do was be a missionary, to get the gospel out into the world. And so they go to Ecuador because they have this one tribe that, that you know, they're, they're trying to make contact with. And, and it was interesting. They were sending little gifts to this tribe, and they would, you know, send it by plane. And, and the Indians actually were sending them back little gifts. So it was kind of like this back and forth. And so Jim and the four men with them felt like, okay, we've made this rapport with them, even though we haven't really seen them. So let's go in and try to actually make contact with them so we can get this going and start telling them about Jesus and all this. So the night before they left, they sang this hymn, We Rest on Thee, Our Shield and Our Defender. Because they have all read Psalm 91. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. They walked into this situation knowing their faith was attached to God. Their faith wasn't attached to, God, you're going to make this all work out for us. They're just saying, God, our faith is in you. But they also knew the rest of this verse. Verse 3, Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Now, if you did not know what Psalms 91 was, e was even about, in context, who it was written to, you would just take that and say, well, there you go. No arrows are going to find me. I'm just, I'm claiming, naming and claiming this verse for myself. But it has nothing to do with actually Aka Indians and Jim Elliot and going in and God protecting them from arrows. It's not about that. Most likely Moses wrote this, and it was all about the Israelites at this particular time. But this psalm in context does not mean that nothing bad will ever, ever happen to you. I, was, I went someplace yesterday, I don't remember where I was, and I got, was talking to this girl, and she goes, yep, you know Psalm 91, God's going to protect us. And I remember thinking, I don't really think that that's true because God doesn't, he didn't protect my friend Lee. Lee died. Do you see what I'm saying? We've got to be really, really careful with all this. But I assume when Jim and these four men went there, they, they just trusted God would protect them. I mean, they, they gave their life to him, but that was probably their trust. But we know the end of that story. They made it to the place where the Indian tribe was, and Jim and the other four men had no idea that these Indians thought that Jim and his friends were cannibals. And in one fell swoop, the spears were thrown, and all five men who loved Jesus with all their heart Five men who all they wanted to do was tell these Indians about Jesus so that they could spend eternity in heaven. All five of them lay dead on the ground in a pool of blood. Here's my point. They trusted in God. They trusted in God's will for their life. They didn't trust God that was like, oh God, I'm just trusting you to, to make this all work out for me. That's not what they did. They had surrendered their lives to, to God a long time ago when they decided to follow Jesus. They had counted the cost. And they had faith, but their faith was attached to a promise that all things will work together for good for those that love Christ Jesus. All things, good, bad, spears being thrown, dying in, in, in Ecuador because you're a missionary, all things. And it's so interesting because the Aka Indian tribe ended up, Elizabeth went back there, they ended up getting to know this tribe, and a lot of this tribe became followers of Jesus. One of the men that actually threw the spear that killed one of these men uh, gave his life to Christ. And God did it, but he did it completely different than what anyone ever thought he would. See, for Elizabeth, her faith was placed in trusting in God not placing her faith in a specific outcome. Big difference there, and we've got to get that. I want to read you something she said, because this is, this is amazing for a woman who lost her husband as he was, you know, with this whole Aka Indian tribe. She wrote this. 
She said, what, what does it mean to dwell in the shelter of the Most High, to dwell under the shadow of the Almighty? Does it mean that the Christian is exempt from suffering? Does it mean that we have a guarantee of physical protection, that we are exempt from the ordinary woes of the human race? She said, if I believe that, I'd probably be in some kind of padded cell by now because if my faith had rested on some superficial notion that the Christians have 75% fewer cavities. She said, we know that the safety and the protection that God promises to those who love him is of a wholly different nature than merely physical. Don't misunderstand me. Of course I believe God can protect us from anything or any kind of physical danger, snares or tempests or snakes or anything else. God did protect Valerie, her daughter, and me from snake bites. We were living all the time with the threat of snakes and we saw many people die. They were not exempt, but God did protect us from those snakes. And you can imagine how many times I prayed as I would see Valerie go off into the jungle trails as a little toddler with the Indians. I knew that there was no way I could protect her, even if I were with her and there was no way the Indians could protect her. So living that situation, I simply had to trust God to do that and he did it. I know that God can, but I will not stand here tonight and tell you that God is going to protect you from physical troubles. I'm not going to tell you that God is going to pay all your debts or heal all your diseases or sort out all your marital difficulties. God can do any of those things, but God has other things in mind than what we have. His protection is a guarantee on a, a different level altogether. My message could never be of temporal blessings without disaster. My husband Jim was killed by the Indians. My second husband died of cancer. What I am learning is to dwell in that refuge, to live under the shadow of the Almighty. I can say with the Apostle Paul, not that I know why God has done what he's done, not that I know exactly what it is that God is doing, but I can say, as Paul said, that I know whom I have believed and I'm absolutely sure that he is able to keep what I have committed to him. When I was 12 to 14, I told the Lord I was willing to be a missionary if that's what he wanted me to be. And it was. When I was in junior college, he made it very clear that this is what he wanted me to do. But when I put my life on the line, I said, Lord, here is my body as a living sacrifice to do anything you want with. And there's no way for me to know what God is going to do. She just nails it. I have faith in God. My faith is not that he's going to protect me, get me better, do anything. My faith is that he is going to do what needs to be done on this earth. I am surrendering my life to him. See, as a follower of Jesus, our faith isn't, isn't in a specific outcome the way we planned it out. We pray, but our faith is in God and his will. That's where we're placing our faith. Our faith is not, because I have faith, God has to do what I ask. Because I have faith, the cardinals will win. Well, of course they have to win, because I have faith. I have faith that I won't get by a car. Then I won't. Because I have faith I will get pregnant next, next, next month. That I will. Like, see the saying? We, we, we have faith to believe things, then when God doesn't do it, it shatters us. Our faith isn't in a specific outcome the way we planned it out. Our faith is in God who will do what needs to be done. And that might mean the Cardinals will lose. And that might mean I will get hit by a car and, and be in the hospital for a long time. That might mean that I will never get pregnant. It might mean that. But it doesn't matter because I've surrendered my life to Jesus and I, I'm surrendering my life to his will. See how far we've gotten away from the faith thing? A faith is that. I, I pray, God, I really, really pray for this. I really pray for this. I pray all the time that my Mormon cousins will come to Jesus. I, I'm trusting God. I don't know what God's going to do with that prayer. I hope he does. I believe that he can change him. Wh wh whether he does, I don't, I don't know. I'm just trusting God for that. And the reason why is because my life is surrendered to him. And I think that's the missing piece to this whole faith thing that we've been taught. My faith has to be attached to God and his word. When our friend died, I just said that. It, my faith rested on this promise. We know that God causes all things to work together for good. To those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. When I'm not sure what to do in my life, do you know what, I, what my faith is in? My faith is in God, and I'm trusting this promise. Because remember, these are promises that he said. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. When I don't know what to do, oh God, I have faith to believe that I'm supposed to go take this job. I, I don't know. I'm trusting in God because he's made a promise that he's going to direct my paths. 
and I don't know how he does that. Maybe I'll get turned down for that job, or maybe I, it, and that's just, that's what I'm trusting God for. Proverbs 16, 9, in his, heart a man's plan, uh, in his heart a man plans his course, but the Lord determines his steps. See, my faith is attached to an object, which is God, and his will, and his word. All right, we're leaving the rabbit trail. So, how does that fit into Galatians? Paul says this in verse 2. This is the only thing I want to find out. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Paul goes on to say, like we just talked about, and he's, he's so frustrated. Verse 3, are you foolish? Are you guys so foolish? Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? In other words, you started out really great. You started out by placing your faith and trust in Jesus alone. But what happens is you unhooked yourself from this and you're trying to do everything on your own. You're out there just trying to just do things yourself. And Paul is like, stop it. Stop it. You can't do that. Everything's changed. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, I will give you a new heart. I will put a new spirit in you. I will remove from you the heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. That's what he's saying. He's like, you, you have to attach yourself to what the Holy Spirit is doing in your life. I realized this the other day. I can be a total brat, just so you know that. So my brattiness was coming out one day and I realized, God, I really don't want to be that way. I really don't. And so what I do is like, I, I pray, God, search me, know my heart, know me, change me. I don't want to be like that. And all of this surrounded a situation where uh, we were in, were in business with, with this one group of people and they're kind of like stealing and lying and they're doing stupid stuff. And, and so my husband's really, really nice. And so we get a commission each month from this. And I knew what Rob was going to do because this is just what Rob is like. And I knew that in his mind, he was like, you know what? I'm just going to take the wood out of the fire and I'm going to give them our commission. Now, I, I don't think that's a good idea. And so my normal bratty self is I'm frustrated, I rant and rave, I cry, I tell Rob we can't do that, you shouldn't do that, and I make Rob's life miserable. But Rob's smart, and he doesn't need me to blah, blah, blah in the background. But I woke up after knowing that I was being a brat, and I woke up and I said, God, I, I don't want to be that way. I want my faith to be in you. I want my faith and trust to be in you because I... I I don't want to have my faith in, in what decision Rob makes. I want my faith to be in you. You're going to take care of us financially. So if Rob does this and gives up our commission, I need, to, I need to be okay with this. So I woke up and Rob's not in bed. And I was like, where is he? he go, I go out and sure enough, he goes, the first thing he says to me is, I want you to know that I offered our commission. And I was shocked. I was shocked because of how I felt. And I felt at peace. I felt completely at peace because the Holy Spirit changed me on the inside. I recognized I had a brattiness problem. And I recognized that I asked God to change me, and he did. And my faith became in God, not in, in an outcome that I thought Rob should do. See how that works? Here's what you and I need to know. You can't change yourself, so stop trying. I can't change myself and make me be someone that I'm not. So I'm going to stop trying and I'm going to recognize my sin. I'm going to ask God to change me and then he does. Paul goes on in verse 4 and says, Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? So then how does he who provides you with the Spirit and works miracles among you do it by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? John Piper said this, The essence of the Galatian heresy is the teaching that you begin your Christian life by faith, and then you grow in your Christian life by works. That is by drawing on powers in yourself to make your contribution to salvation. One modern form of the heresy is God helps those who help themselves. Faith is the only response to God's word which makes room for the spirit to work in us and through us. See how that works? It's not, it got, it's what I said. We recognize our sin. We ask God to change us. And then we move on from there because he does. Now, Paul goes on to remind this group of Galatians about Abraham all the way back in Genesis. The Jews revered Abraham. 
So Paul goes on in Galatians and talks to these people, and he says in verse 6, Even so, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham didn't do things so God would accept him. Abraham believed God, and God accepted him. See how that works? Remember, Paul's coming up against the Judaizers who are saying you have to do things, but it's different now. Verse 7, Paul goes on, Therefore be sure that it is those who are of faith who are sons of Abraham. The scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, All the nations will be blessed in you. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. Faith, not works. This is what he keeps saying over and over and over with all these different illustrations. He's saying you cannot unhook from God and, and just start working your way to heaven. It doesn't work that way. There was a pastor who went, um, uh, he went to see a famous chef in Toronto. Someone asked the, a chef a really interesting question. He said, uh, what's it like to be on TV? What's it like to be, have published all these books that are read by millions of people? And the chef said, it's really frustrating. It's frustrating because all the people that are watching the TV shows and reading the books, they're still not doing anything I've asked them to do. They're not, they're not eating well. They're still eating garbage. They're not eating healthy. He said the people were hearing his message, but they were not changing. The pastor leaned over to his wife and said, I know exactly how he feels. And see, I think that's how Paul was feeling too. You foolish Galatians, I keep telling you over and over and over that there's freedom in Christ, true freedom, and you're just not even believing me. You're not changing. You're not letting the Holy Spirit do anything in your life. Ephesians 2, 8 says this, for it's by grace you've been saved through faith. It's, it's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. It's not by works so that no one can boast. So here's what I want to say today. I hope this is freeing to some of you. Because some of you are still so under the law, basically, and you just feel like you have to do all these things to make God happy, and you're on this hamster wheel, and you cannot seem to get off. But I want you today to get off of that wheel. Place your faith and trust in Jesus alone. Say, God, I'm giving you my life. I'm surrendering my life to you. The Holy Spirit will come in and start changing you on the inside. What happens is that, that this robe of righteousness that Jesus had, he dies on the cross, he pays for my sins, and you know what he does? He puts that robe on me. And now I'm covered with him. When God sees me, he doesn't see me and my sin and my brattiness, he sees Jesus. That's what that's all about. We can't do anything to get this robe except have faith. And we have to attach our faith to Jesus. That's how we become a follower of Jesus. And that's actually how we live out our Christian life. Father, thank you for this word today. God, I pray that each one of us will change our view on faith so that we understand we have to put our faith and trust in you alone. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for all the things that Paul went through to get us to the place where we can understand this, so we can understand the true gospel, so we can have true freedom. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have a really good week.